Hey there, everyone. This is Prophetess Marina Summers with The Wall, www.meetmeatthewall.org. You can get on our website and check us out as well. I'm looking forward to you hearing the word that we have on the line today. God is blessing us. I tell you, 2014 is the year of the favor of the Lord, and it's double for everything. Double portion, a complete double. Remember that the number 14 is seven and seven, which means complete, but it also means double, a double portion, the year of the favor of the Lord. Come in and join us with the wall on the line. And thank you for being a part of what God is doing throughout the nation and spreading the gospel, healing our land and territory and families. Come and join us now. Again, this is Prophetess Marina Summers with www.meetmeatthewall.org. I want to talk about today in the same book uh, by Chuck D. Pierce, A Time to Defeat the Devil. Uh, and time to defeat, defeat the strategy to win, the spiritual war. And the time to defeat the devil in the spiritual war, it's a time of manifestation. And this is what he's really talking about. When you begin to look at this and begin to dig into this, and um, I would encourage you to go get this. Uh, it's got a time clock on it. It's called Time to Defeat the Devil, Strategies to Win the Spiritual War by Chuck D. Pierce. I love Chuck's books because they are exactly why I know God has headed us on this line and what we're doing as far as praying. But I want to deal with that today. It's called The Passover, a God's Plan for Freedom. And this is a powerful, powerful chapter that we're going to be uh, dipping into and diving into and what God is going to reveal to us, becoming aware of God what is out there that we should be looking for. You are called to pass over into deliverance and healing. Hallelujah. The call of God is progressive. Oh, come on. It doesn't end. Passover causes the enemy to pass over. Why pass over today? Come on, in the name of Jesus. What makes Passover so important? The battle continues. The battle for Passover is seen clearly in the church history. We see a biblical pattern. The first Passover night and pro prototype, overcoming strongholds and tearing down iniquitous thrones. My God, today, are we under the same bondage as Israel? Why in Egypt was, was Egypt? It says, are we under the same bondage as Israel was in Egypt? Come on in Jesus' name. So these are some of the things that we are going to deal with today. Hallelujah. I want to dive right in here. And it says the last, he talks about the last three chapters beyond and moving into a future. The Lord has to teach us. Uh, he talks about, he mentioned to Israel how they came out of Egypt and had to learn to break the power of submerged identity. We will now begin, he'll talk about discussing the, uh, that we can vex our spirits and keep us from seeing into a new realm. In this chapter, he wants to talk about uh, how we will see how the Passover points us to our own to pass over and to the freedom God has for us, and we'll identify those things we need to pass over. So he's going to talk about that. Um, God said to Egypt has a spiritual meaning for us today. And it talks about we will learn about the blood key from freedom and see how to relate to the clear vision. Understanding the blood key is one of the components necessary in overcoming the enemy. I want you to remember that word blood key because it's very important to defeating our enemy. It's manifestation time. But in manifestation time, in manifestation time, we have to make sure that we are on top of the next move of the enemy before he makes his next move. So my amen. You can just say amen. Becoming aware of God. To see beyond where we are presently, presently see both spiritual and physical, we must become aware that God is. The first step is doing so is to lift up your eyes and see Psalms 121. Amp says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills around Jerusalem to scarce Mount Zion and Mount Moriah. From the wind show, my help come. My help comes from the Lord who had, heaven and, who had heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip or to be moved. He will keep you, will keep you, will not slumber. Behold, who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper, and the Lord is your shade on your right hand, and the side not carrying the shield. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from the evil. He will keep your life, and the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from the time forth and forevermore. 
religiously, the best premise is that man is able to surpass himself by entering into relationship with the creator of the world. However, relationships far exceed religion. Religion is far for a time in the earth. Relationship can be eternal. Man who is a part of this world can have relationship with one who is greater than the, this world. Man must have a sense of mystery. Once it, etern, eternity is in a man's heart, he has the ability to see beyond space and time. Now, when he says man, he's talking about every creation, including us. Okay, because God created man to create woman. So he's talking about all of us. That word man is the meaning of all of us. He's not just talking about a man. He's talking about every one of us. Hallelujah. This mystery must be planted in the hearts of man. Once the mystery is there, you can see it in two dimensions. That will also take you beyond the natural. My God. This is a time to see the greater purpose of God. When we lift up our eyes, we come face to face, and we transform into the identity that our creator has for our future. Each time we lift up our eyes, we see into the dimension that will cause us to overcome it into the future. We see as he sees. So we want to see as God sees. And we don't want to miss what God has so that we can see it. Hallelujah. What is out there that we should be looking for? Come on, I want you to hear this. When man was created, he was confronted with the presence of, God, of the Lord. Man learns to look for his presence on a daily basis. Number one, we're looking for his presence on a daily basis. As he worked and watched after the garden relationship formed, daily he looked for his creator to commune with him. You want to see the one communing with you. There is a voice going before you that you want to learn, to recognize. So you always prosper, multiply, and are led toward the best. The thing man and woman did not see correctly was a serpent. Okay. That, that, that is key. When you read the book of Genesis, you can sur surmise that there, were, there was used to, they were used to animals talking and communing with them in the garden. So they were used to this. They were used to seeing the animals talking. They were used to communing with the animals. Come on, and the animals talking back. <laughs> Hallelujah, this is amazing. However, the serpent was different from the other animals. His voice enticed them to see into a realm that the one they were communing with had forbidden to them to see into. The only way they could see into this realm was to eat of a fruit that was forbidden. Their desire for that fruit had to overcome their alignment with the one with whom they walked on daily basis. I believe the serpent calls them to see the fruit from a seducing point of view or perspective. You can also perceive that the serpent convinced them that God, the one with whom they walked and talked with, holding from them something necessary for their future. That's what he convinced them. So the enemy is always convincing us, why are you doing this when you can be doing this? Because that's holding you back from what you need to be doing over here. Hallelujah. That's an enticement. That's, a, that's one thing we need to be looking for. We need to be alert of. Come on, and always communing in his presence. This deceived them and clouded their vision and set in motion the atmosphere of decay. We must see our enemy correctly if we are to advance. Come on, we must see our enemy correctly if we're going to advance. We must see re revelation and gain understanding. This is a key to our advancement. We must be able to analyze separate and determine how the information that is revealed to us is to be used for our progress. This is what I call the revelation key. Revelation creates vision. Provision is a part of our vision. If we have vision, we have poor vision. Supply is needed for victory. From vision, our supply lines form. We must see our opportunities. One of my favorite stories is about the blind man who begins to yell, Son of David, heal me. He was blind, but he saw his opportunity of healing and did not let the opportunity escape. Come on, we need to always be seeing our opportunity, but we need to see, hallelujah, the revelation. Revelation creates a vision. Provision is a part of our vision. If we have vision, we have provision. The supply is needed for the victory. You are called to pass over into a deliverance and healing. Uh, he talks about it, and we are going to discuss a Passover or the act of passing over. Passing over into freedom should be a deep desire for each of us. Come on, passing over in freedom should be a deep desire for each of us. Once we have passed over, we should feel called to see others pass over. 
when I think of the call of God, I always think of Moses instead of enjoying a place of royalty in Egypt. Moses became a shepherd in the medium, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep that was there. God had prepared him for 40 years. Many of you are being prepared, and some of you have been in preparation for many years. I'm an intercessor. Even though I know by many around the world, I know by many around the world as an apostolic prophetic leader in the body of Christ, I would have to determine that my ultimate call is intercession. So we could be all the evangelists and prophets in the world, but our ultimate call on this line, and we know in our lives, is pulling on us, is intercession. Intercession. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So that would be intercession. Intercession is it. Somebody say amen. I always think of Moses instead of you. So he talks about him as being an intercessor. The Lord spoke to me to determine that my ultimate call is intercession. The Lord spoke to me from Ezekiel 13, 5. You have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall. Oh, my God for the house of Israel to stand in a battle on the day of the Lord. This happens when I was in my late 20s. Of course, I did not understand the fullness of what this verse meant, but I did embrace the call. While I was in a non-denominational church, God began to bring people into, he talks about this, my life to develop this call. Actually, God initiated a book. This initiation of the call occurred during my second year of college. I was a Baptist student, Union State convention in 1972 when the speaker gave an invitation. I heard these words form in my spirit. I have called you for healing of the nation. Although I had not fully determined the course I felt I should pursue in college. I was already studying the course related to preem and I went for award of surrendering to the words of I heard my sing- by singing a mission card, although I had no understanding of the call. My mind definitely resisted the thought of studying for eight years and then ended up in a foreign nation as a medical missionary. I could not get away from this experience. Even when I switched to the field of business, the next year my change in direction did not change God's plan. <laughs> so no matter where we get headed, where we go, God's plan stays the same. And that is the truth. No matter what I do, no matter where we are, it's just like the wall. When God called us in Nehemiah 6 and 1, he called me to build a wall. And, and how do you build a wall? You build a wall through prayer. We go about and we build walls. We bring healing to the land by rebuilding the walls in cities, in nations, in, re- in regions. That's how we rebuild the wall. And even though I was at a place and when I started the line, I wasn't at a position where I understood everything. But it began to manifest over the years what God really wanted to do on this line. And now he's doing it. And there's still more that has to manifest. There's still more. But this is manifestation year. So we're going to see some things that are going to manifest that we might have prayed for last year that are coming forth this year or the year before that or the year before that that are coming this year or even the year before that, because God has manifested. But at the same time, he's allowing us to understand how we can walk through this manifestation and keep it. Hallelujah. The call of God is progressive. The call of God is progressive. This actually means that you have a starting point. But God matures us into a fullness of his plan. God has a plan over the life of each one of us. He also has a plan for people's groups and plans for nations. When we... When he was knitting us together in our mother's womb, the plan was being initiated. The call of God is the highest part of God's plan for us individually. God then matures our individual call as we align corporately in the body of Christ. Come on, we got to get aligned, got to get aligned, got to get aligned. Got to get in the right place at the right time, in the right church, in the right ministry, in the right giving, and planting the right seeds and the right season so we can see manifestation. Come on, in the name of Jesus. This is God. So he says, he says that individuals are aligned corporately in the body of Christ. We were never made to be independent. God made us so that our gifts and destinies would align with others. So we aren't no renegade. We don't fly out alone. We got to line up with something, somebody, another ministry, a pastor, a shepherd. Come on, somebody. We got to be in the line. Are we out of the will of the Lord? We were never meant to be alone. We have to be aligned with somebody. The hand needs the arm, the eye needs the mind, and so on. Once we find our place in the body of Christ and we sit 
set in that room has been made for our kids. Our call is extended to the city and territory that we are a part of it as we become stewards, faithful to demonstrate God's covenant plan in every aspect of our life. He can extend our call even to a nation. Therefore, the function ability of our gifts can increase and be used in a greater scope function or fears of authority. Over the last 30 or so years, I have watched the Lord develop his call in my life for the healing of the nation. He first assigned me to pray for my extended family, which had been scattered. The Lord showed me that if I would take my stand, if you are on the line, please push star six to mute yourself and please announce yourself. Who has come on the line with us this morning? Pastor Moody. Praise the God. If you could push star six, Pastor Moody, hallelujah, so that we can begin to mute ourselves. Praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us. It says here that he would restore our family and then had to make us stand on behalf of our friend who was going in the wrong direction. God has made us stand and intercede for the friends until we surrender to the call of God, the minister, the word. He then had to take a stand on behalf of our church, and uh, he talks about his wife I was, as we were attending. This church was experiencing growth and entering into a major building program, and the Lord began to visit and pour out his spirit in a new way in the midst of the body. The Lord then asked of him to pray that the church nation uh, form a Soviet bloc country. At this point, he stepped over into a dynamic of understanding the healing of the nation. He said he rallied prayers and worked on other organizations to see the oppressed Christians in those areas released from the prison in the name of Jesus. God has assigned us to pray for many nations, and that's what he's done. And by faith, he has increased us and has progressed us in his calling to believe for the healing of the nation and the release of the captivity from Satan's dominion. While Moses was pastoring Jethro's flock, he was called by God and a bush burned. And Moses turned to the fire and came to an angel and spoke to God and met face to face. Moses was fit to deliver and listen carefully for his call in being released from heaven. In a new way to us this day, Moses turned aside and looked. I am sure he looked again and then entered into a dimension that was beyond anything he had known. This dimension would lead him to overcome personal and corporately. A people who are vexed under Egypt's slavery system of idolatry would how no, would now be delivered, offered in a way of escape, and given the opportunity to enter to the future. Moses' call was key to the people's passing out of slavery. In the name of Jesus, they had to have a deliverer. They counted these events and how they apply to us are important. In our advancement, your participation in Passover will be one of the first steps to your freedom from vexation. We vex, vex ourselves. We put ourselves in a place of bondage, and what God is saying is that he's going, he's bringing us out of this place. He wants us to stay in freedom, because in freedom, we can then see where God is headed and where God is taking us as we are praying as intercessors. We can see beyond ourselves. And begin to see God's call and to see his vision. Where there is vision, come on, there is provision. He supplies for victory. Well, I don't want you to ever forget that. Where there is vision, there is provision because he supplies for victory. If God has given us a vision, then he's got provision. And he's going to supply for you to get the victory. Hallelujah. Passover causes the enemy to pass over. <laughs> this is interesting. We had discussed how we engrafted into God's covenant with Abraham. Today, Abraham in, in Hebrew, which means one who passes over. Now, not long ago, Pastor Rhonda talked about the covenant of Abraham. Now, I want you to seriously listen to this because because this is a, a very uh, uh, a place where we are at in the body of Christ in 2014 is manifestation year. But these covenants <laughs> are a part of manifestation. It says that who has a pass who is passing over has a huge army that. Consistently is passing over. When we were grafted into the one who passes over through the one who passed over through the cross, we will always be able to pass over. Woo! What a state through the blood of Christ. We are adopted or grafted into the covenant of God that ensures us that we can pass over. Biblically, one of the most important times of the year is known as the Passover. Passover is a celebration of redemption, deliverance by the power of the blood. This feast celebrates Israel's deliverance from Egypt but also our deliverance from Satan and sin by the blood of Jesus. Our Passover lamb in Exodus 12, we read 
they were to take a lamb and kill it in the twilight, and they should they shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorsteps and on the lintel of the houses where they eat in. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire, unleavened bread and with and bitter herbs, and they shall eat it. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Exodus 12, 6, 8, and 11, and 12. When we understand the story of the Passover, we can better overcome demonic forces that holds us as God's children in bondage. In the book of Exodus, Israel was a slavery in the in, in Egypt. Egypt was a proud country, the most advanced and powerful nation in the world. It was known for magnificent architect, great learning, military might. As Exodus began, we find that Egypt, Egyptians had held Israel under cruel oppression. 44 years, 4,400 years, excuse me, 4,400 years, 4,400 years. The Israelites had been beaten, worked to death, and seen their children murdered. The good news was God had a plan for freedom. God always has a plan for freedom. As Israel cried out to God, he put his plan into action to understand God's plan for Israel. We need to understand what has happened to Egypt and the spiritual realm. Egypt was a land filled with temples and monuments built to honor false gods. Egyptians worshipped those false gods and trusted in them for their prosperity and security. But false gods are nothing more than demons. The Egyptians' false worship actually created demonic structures over the land that held in bondage. That was always happening. And adultery, adultery of false worship into the land forms of demonic structures over the territory, which hold people in bondage. Come on, come on. That's what's happening now in this, in this world. False gods. False things standing up. You see all these statues. You see all these monuments. You see all these different things that go up that represent something that they say they're doing, but really it is false gods. And it releases demonic forces. And you wonder how come our cities and our communities and some of our churches are in bondage. Come on, in the name of Jesus. God makes it very clear. The Egyptians also live under the cruel oppression of demonic powers in 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 any land that has no Christians or word-based here heritage or level of darkness and oppression exists. That's where, that's what we've never experienced in America. Even for those involved in idolatry, it's not pleasant. The land of Egypt was shrewd in that kind of darkness. So demonic forces over Egypt created a, a severe within, within which God's people could be held captive. So before Israel could be free, the demonic structure over the territory had to be removed. God did that in series of power encounters with those demonic forces, which we call the plagues of Egypt. The plagues of Egypt were con confrontation with the demonic religious structure of the land designed to break their power. As we will see in the in a few other chapters, he's going to be talking about God's 10 steps program to freedom from Israel. God wants to see you set free from bondage of the enemy as well. Begin today to ask God to show you how the enemy has held you in bondage how he has held you in bondage. As we begin to pray, we need to know how you have, how is this city, how is this place, how is our, even our backyard, our families, come on in the name of Jesus, been held by our churches, the people in our churches, how are they held in bondage? There's something territorial, there's some kind of force that's keeping that practice in place. But we have the power to break it. Where there is vision, there is provision, and God supplies the victory. He supplies the need for the victory. Hallelujah. He keeps telling us it's manifestation time. But to get there, we need some strategic keys. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Why Passover today? So many have asked a simple question. Why Passover in the world that is in one most historical seasons of realignment and change? God's people must record their lives and cry again. Let us go that we may worship in Exodus 12, 13 to 14. We read, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy when you are, when to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Passover is a celebration designed by God. This feast and event was eat, was given to 
increase our faith and prepare us to enter in the fullness of his blessing. Passover was commanded by God for the Jews in the Old Testament to teach them the importance of redemption by the blood. But it was also observed by Christians in the New Testament to remember and under God's redeeming work, the Bible tells us, it is to be a permanent ordinance, a celebration for all time. Many Christians don't realize that Passover is just as much a New Testament feast as an Old Testament feast. It all, all, it's all through the New Testament. Jesus, the apostle, all celebrated Passovers. The original Lord's Supper was a Passover meal. The apostles taught the Gentile churches to celebrate Passover. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote to a predominantly Gentile church and said, Christ, Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8. For hundreds of years, Passover was the most important yearly celebration in the early church. What makes Passover so important? Derek Prince once said that the most powerful faith declaration for deliverance is this. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb out of the hand of the enemy. He said that if you can make a declaration in faith and keep on making it, something will happen. You will be delivered from the power of the enemy. That is really the message of Passover. The feast of Passover is a faith declaration that we are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. It does not something in us. It's not, it, does, it does something in us when it celebrates the Passover. When we come together to remember God's great works of redemption and declare the power of redemption in our lives today, it always does something. Passover is very important to God, but the enemy resists the whole concept of Passover. The, the enemy has worked diligently to steal Passover away. The good news is God is restoring Passover, but it is a battle. The battle for Passover is the battle for the blood. Satan wants to give us a blood, bloodless religion because a bloodless religion has no power. And the power is in the blood. There always is a battle for Passover. There's always a battle for Passover. So no matter what, we talked about last night how there's a battle to, to seal up the hedges and the breaches. It's a battle to do that. It's not just, it, it, it's, it, and that's the thing we have to understand, a battle. The battle is not in the natural. The battle is in the spiritual. So we don't have to fight this battle in the natural, but we can fight it in intercession. We can fight it through prayer. That's where the battle starts. That's where the battle is. Hallelujah. The battle continues. Many of the church resists Constantine and Dick's. So for many centuries after Constantine, the battle of the Passover continues. In the 6th century, for example, Emperor uh, Justinian sent the Roman army throughout the empire to enforce the prohibition of our Passover. In this attempt, it wipes out the heresy of Passover. Thousands of men, women, and children were brutally murdered. Entire cities were massacred for refusing to stop celebrating Passover. Pressured by the government, the Roman church joined in the attempt to stamp out Passover. Notice some of the decrees passed against Passover by various churches and councils. The Council of Antioch, A.D. 345. If a bishop, a presbyter, a deacon, will dare after this decree be celebrated Passover and council judges them to be athenia from the church. This council not only deposes from them from ministry, but also in other others who dare to communicate with them. The word thea means cursed. So he cursed them from the ministry. The church actually pronounces a curse on Christians who would celebrate Passover. Come on. This is real. It's in the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 365. It is not prohibited to re receive festivals which are by Jews. Come on. It is, it is prohibited. It's, it's, it's not permitted. The Council of uh, Agia, France. Christians must not take part in Jewish festivals. The Council of Toledo X, 7th century. Easter must be celebrated at the time set by the decree of Anicia. The battle for Passover is seen clearly in the church history. The battle against Passover is nothing new. We see the same thing in the Bible. Satan always tries to steal away Passover because he knows the celebration of the blood releases power. Come on, the blood releases power. So when you're celebrating the Passover, when you're celebrating the blood, the blood, because without the blood, there's no power. The enemy wants to take out the blood. The whole, the whole strategic plan is to take out the blood. When he takes out the blood, he takes out the faith. He takes out the faith, there is nothing. And then he has squeezed the life, not just out of us, but out of our nations, out of our cities, out of our regions, out of our churches, out of our children. But thank God that he's restoring, he's constantly restoring what the enemy has tried to take out. Again, this is Prophetess Marina Summers with www.meetmeatthewall.org. Thank you 
for being a part of what God is doing throughout the nation and spreading the gospel, healing our land and territory and families.